I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me here. I am honored. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and, uh, you know, I was invited to sort of come and speak about my experiences um, after 9-11 and uh, uh, my speech at that time, which provoked quite a response uh, from across the country. Um, but I don't want to focus on that. I thought what I would really like to do is use this opportunity to look at where we are 10 years hence, 10 years after the attacks of 9-11 and the launching of the war on terror. And I wanted to talk about some of the challenges that we face today. So I'm going to begin by talking about you know, what has changed and what I think are some of the major challenges that we face today in the wake of, of uh, 10 years of uh, the war on terror. So the first thing I'd like to say is on the anniversary um, last week, the thing that really struck me when I was listening to all of the public commemorations both here in the US, and it, what was really striking to me was the complete lack of self-reflexivity about what has happened in the 10 years. Uh, what was really uh, also kind of frustrating and concerning was the lack of self-reflexivity in the media about how they had covered, A, the original events of 9-11, and then how they have covered and not covered the war on terror and its impact on populations around the world. The complete lack of self-reflexivity self-reflexivity on the part of political leaders and public commentators uh, or in the public commemoration. So to hear uh, uh, Prime Minister Harper talk about Islamicism as being the biggest threat that Canada faces uh, was deeply, deeply frustrating and also really disturbing because, uh, you know, they, they, if there had been any hope that the experience of the last 10 years would give rise to a transformed approach towards global politics, towards the relationships with the rest of the world, Canada's, and towards the relationships with the US administration on the part of the government, on the part of the media, on the part of, you know, uh, 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 I guess, ruling elites. This hope was largely dashed by all of the commemorations that I watched. I think an assessment of what has changed in the last 10 years should begin first by recognizing that it was not the 9-11 attacks themselves that brought about the changes in the geopolitical order that is promoting greater violence, terror, and torture. After all, the Oklahoma City bombings did not elicit a similar response from the US state. So it is the war in terror that was launched in response to the 9-11 attacks that is eroding the rights and entitlements of Muslims wherever they are in the world, undermining the idea of the rule of law at, in, at the international level, and is destroying the sovereignty such as it was of states in the Middle East, in Central Asia, and increasingly in other parts of the world. So my first point is that through all of these commemorations, it was always 9-11 that was identified as the cause of all the changes that have taken place. And I think it's really important to put it in perspective and re recognize that it was the response to the attacks, the launching of a global war as a response to the attack that has brought about these changes. The most significant impact of the war, I think, is that, of course, Afghanistan and Iraq are two countries that have been shattered by the war on terror. The societies there have been devastated, hundreds of thousands killed, large-scale displacement of populations, destruction of the infrastructure, the fueling of international, internal divisions and civil wars in these countries, and also the imposition of compliant elites in the new governments who front for the occupation forces. In the countries of the West, or the global North as some people prefer to call it, we've also seen major transformations. The attack on dissent, the erosion 
of civil rights and liberties, paranoia in public spaces, the incitement of hatred towards and suspicion of Muslims, putting a chill on their participation in public spaces, in struggling to protect their rights, and even in their very presence in public spaces. Add to that the awful sentimentality that we have in place of politics. And Lauren Ballant has written very interestingly about the infantilizing and the sentimentalization of politics in the US. In Canada, one sentence stops any serious political discussion about the war on terror. Canadians are there to send little Afghan girls to schools. End of discussion. So this awful sentimentality that we have in the place of politics is something that we really, really have to change. Certainly in Canada, we've experienced the Americanization of foreign policy, but also important to recognize that we're now going through an Israelization of security measures. In Vancouver, for example, the city I live in, Transport Canada has introduced a pilot project at the airport that is monitoring the behavior of passengers in the airport area. The project is called Passenger Behavior Observation. And officers will be looking out for indicators that they will use to identify certain passengers as security threats. This pilot project is modeled on Israeli security measures and during the week commemorating the 10th anniversary of 9-11, CBC Radio in Vancouver ran a series on these new security quote-unquote threats and the new security measures. And they ran several interviews with Israeli intelligence officers discussing this pilot project at Vancouver Airport and advising Canada about the efficacy of such measures. Not once was it pointed out that Canada is not Israel. That Israel's security apparatus is based on that state's identification of itself as a Jewish state, treating non-Jewish populations as less than citizens, and hence as all security threats. It is also a state that is engaged in the occupation of Palestinians who are fighting for self-determination. The Israeli security apparatus has emerged within the context of these priorities and commitments of the state. For Canada to import such security measures is a very dangerous sign of where the Canadian state and security agencies think they are headed. Now, of course, Israel and Canada do have certain things in common. They're both settler societies. They're both shaped by racial hierarchies. But the form in which indigenous peoples who've been colonized in Canada are struggling for self-determination is very, very different <coughs> from the form of the struggles that Palestinians are engaged in. And the Israeli security apparatus has actually been developed in concert with the needs of Israel as a colonial settler society in a land that Palestinians are struggling to gain claim over. So it's really uh, very disturbing the way in which this Israelization of security, pol uh, uh, security measures in Canada is literally being implemented under the radar with, from what I could see, very little opposition. The last 10 years, I think, have seen the development of a new multi-pronged model of US-led imperialist interventions for our age. And I think it's important that we recognize the different ways in which the imperialist wars of our time are being fought right now. So when we look at this new model that has emerged in the early 21st century, the first model is, of course, Afghanistan and Iraq, sending in troops in direct on-the-ground invasion and occupation of these countries. The ideological argument here is that these countries have become basis for terrorists and are, and are providing a staging ground 
and support for their campaigns against the US and the West. This strategy, of course, has relied on the privatization of war. We've seen mercenaries hired by the state to take on actions previously part of the military apparatus. We're likely, I think, to see less of this type of intervention now that the resistance to US-led occupations have proved to be stronger than anticipated and the insurgents have been getting stronger, inflicting more losses, more damages on the US forces and the other occupation forces, the other allied occupation forces there, and having led to the stretching of US military resources to a limit. Also given that the other US allied states are not willing to carry the burden of having their troops on the ground in large numbers, Add to that the costs of the invasions and occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan. They have proven to be very, very heavy for the United States. So I think that we will not see this model repeated again very quickly, which leads me to the second model that we're seeing, and that is in the case of Libya. And in this model, what we're seeing is the identification of rebel groups within countries of strategic importance and then arming them while using the immense US air power and that of other NATO allies in bombing campaigns from outside to help these rebel groups to come to power. The ideological position here is that the state is preparing to wage mass violence against its own populations and we have a humanitarian uh, a rationale that is provided for this form of imperialist aggression and intervention. The third model I think we're seeing is the providing of US and other states support for local states to clamp down on their own popular movements in their countries, like Bahrain and Yemen. And if that fails, then the state is unable to hold on to power and to crush popular movements as was the case in Egypt, then what we see is a providing of support and aid to the new factions that are coming to power and to help shape their particular agendas and derail the possibility for revolutionary change. So I think we have to recognize this multi-pronged strategy and see the different aspects of that as all interrelated. And what I want to do now is to focus on three major aspects of the war that I think we need to consider urgently. And when I say we, I mean social justice movements here, as well as activist scholars. Because some of the blind spots that we're very easy uh, in pointing out as existing in the media, in the ruling elites, neoconservatives, neoliberals, some of those um, gaps exist in our own analysis. And I want us to be self-critical and to be thinking about these aspects in the work that we do as we're trying to promote social change, as we're fighting for an anti-colonial, anti-imperialist agenda. What I'm struck by when I see how some of the movements are mobilizing is the overlap between many, many strategies that are emanating from the ultra-right and that end up being reproduced, whether wittingly or otherwise, in social justice movements. So the first thing I want to focus on is the emergence of a new juncture <clears throat> with the war on, te on, on terror. And this new juncture, I think, is built on a consensus within society that subsumes the divisions of class, gender, sexuality, even race to a certain extent, and other social relations. That's one, I think, issue that we need to pay a great deal of attention to. And the second one is the pervasiveness of Islamophobia and the inadequacy of our responses to it, which hinder the building of resistance movements and social justice movements that can be truly anti-colonial and anti-racist in their politics. 
So the war on terror marks a new juncture that has facilitated the emergence of a new political consensus that is sustained, I think, not only by the ultra-right, by neoconservatives and neoliberals, but also by the left, also by social justice activists and our movements, by feminists and feminist movements, and sometimes also by anti-racist movements, with very little critical analysis of the fundamental aspects of this new juncture. Here I'm arguing that the war is a distinct watershed in processes of capitalist globalization and resistance, which has given rise to this emergent new socio-political consensus, which while it's clearly shaped by neoconservative socio-political and economic ambitions and agendas, is utterly reliant on the convergence of these agendas with those of political forces and constituencies that we often define as oppositional, including social democratic, left, and feminist constituencies. So what do I mean by this? What is this convergence? Before the 9-11 attacks and prior to the war on terror, in the late 1990s, towards the end of the 20th century, the impact of globalization was becoming more and more apparent and giving rise to greater and greater resistance by social movements against states and their implementation of neoliberal restructuring. Feminists, labor activists, anti-poverty activists, anti-racist, and you know the general kind of spectrum of anti-globalization activists and indigenous activists were among the most critical and vocal opponents of the social and economic restructuring, not only in terms of its impact on their own communities and in their own countries, but also at the global level. International alliances were also getting stronger, as was reflected in the politics of these movements where organizations met together at every major international meetings of heads of states and international financial institutions, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, etc., where these organizations and movements came together to organize people's summits, demonstrations, and they also disrupted many of these meetings. Of course, their perspectives and priorities were very different. There were divisions among them. And I don't want to minimize these divisions and these com conflicting interests as well. But there was a generally broadly shared consensus that the privatization and restructuring were eroding the socioeconomic gains that marginalized and disenfranchised groups had made since the 1960s. That the neoliberal restructuring was decimating social programs and that the profound restructuring of immigration, citizenship policy, the welfare state, and the labor market were having very detrimental impacts on large sectors of the constituencies of these movements. If these movements were vocal, so too was the backlash against them, articulated in the ultranationalist, right-wing, anti-immigrant, anti-feminist, anti-indigenous rights politics, of the newly emergent right-wing political parties and of the ultra-right groups. The Reform Party and Stephen Harper today is a direct consequence of that backlash. Not only were the shifts feeding the neoliberal and neoconservative constituencies, they also were having an impact on social democratic parties and left parties prodding them to move further and further to the right, often becoming indistinguishable from the neoliberals. In Ontario, of course, those of you who live through the rule of the NDP know very well what I'm describing here. The attacks of 9-11 and the war on terror changed all of that. And what we now have is a new consensus that has emerged regarding the threat of terror and the threat of terror as specifically embodied by Islamist movements and potentially all Muslims by religious affiliation. Social movements were of course divided in their responses to the war on terror. While some supported some aspects of the war on terror, others opposed other aspects of it. 
Some were ambivalent about the Afghan war, but nevertheless came to support it as necessary. The attack on Afghanistan by many left activists, including in the South Asian region, and by feminists as well, was seen as the lesser evil. Many more opposed the Iraq war, defining it as unnecessary and a war, on a war of choice. Given these divided political responses to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, were these movements likewise divided in their theoretical assumptions and political analysis of the new problem that had emerged as a threat, a global threat, the problem of terror, and the new enemy that had emerged the Islamic fundamentalist? The answer is yes and no. Yes, in that many social movements and activists sought to deconstruct the threat of terror by pointing out that state violence was also inflicting terror, that foreign policy was promoting terrorist responses, that it was actually increasing the terrorist threat, that the label terrorist was being used for other ends by states to destroy opposition to its policies, that the label terrorist was being applied to all Muslims in a racialized manner and thus was making an entire population suspect by religious affiliation. But when I ask whether their responses were different from the neoconservatives and the neoliberals, when the question turns to Islam, to Islamists, and to the threat of Islamic fundamentalism, then most social movements have accepted the definition of these as the enemy that needs to be defeated, even if by means other than war, torture, violence, bombing, even if it means working within the rule of law, etc., etc. Here we have a convergence that this is a global threat that has to be defeated in one way or the other. The important political differences among the otherwise disparate constituencies have been subsumed in the consensus, the consensus that underlies this new juncture that I'm arguing exists, no matter how reluctantly that consensus is granted, has emerged in support of combating Islam, Islamists and their terrorism in order to protect their own national, transnational securities and alliances. For in whatever else they may disagree, these newly allied constituencies, and I mean here social movements, in the West share the fears, hatreds, and anxieties about the dangers presented to them by Islamists and potentially all believing Muslims. They share the fear of this threat and danger with their states and ruling elites. This consensus, I think, has been strong enough to override to a significant degree whatever internal ideological and political disagreements may exist among them. And they're strong indeed. I don't want to minimize how strong they are, including, as I said, divisions about the most effective ways of confronting such dangers and such enemies. I have discussed elsewhere how feminists have played a key role in facilitating the emergence of this consensus, regardless of the theoretical traditions of feminism within which they might place their political and theoretical commitments. And I've also talked about the move by a vigilante form of masculinity into the center of US political life, which remains dominant even 10 years hence. But it is the sharing of the ideological grounding of this new juncture that I'm defining as hugely problematic, the ideological construct of Islamists, Islamist terror, and the role of this in holding the entire ideological frame of the war on terror together. This, I argue, is what has enabled the coming together of these different and otherwise oppositional forces and constituencies. And it is this shared Islamophobia that has enabled the strange new convergence of interests, which I think in the long term is going to have very, very profound consequences long after American troops withdraw from Iraq and Afghanistan, 
as they surely must. Many of us, of course, have worked hard to name the Islamophobia that has become pervasive after 9-11. But I think what we need to think about is what has the popularization and institutionalizing institutionalization of this Islamophobia actually accomplished not only in terms of furthering the agendas of neoconservatives and neoliberals, but also what impact has it had on the politics that are articulated by social justice movements. So what is Islamophobia? Most simply defined, it is the fear and hatred of Islam. Islamophobia defines Islam as an inherently violent and misogynist religion that promotes terrorism and the hatred of women. As such, Islamophobia promotes the fear, suspicion, and hatred of Muslims who, say to be sanctioned by their religion, are seen as hate-filled fanatics, irrational in their beliefs and practices, and who will go to any length to promote their repressive and violent religion and to destroy liberal democratic societies based on pluralism, religious coexistence and egalitarian social and gender and sexual norms. It is important for us to recognize, and in fact many of us in this room have pointed out, that Islamophobia shuts down a climate of looking at the heterogeneity within Muslim communities. What I want to argue is that Islamophobia also shuts down any kind of serious engagement, serious political, theoretical engagement with Islamists, with Islam, and with the perspectives and political demands that are being made by Islamists. In other words, Islamophobia puts in the place of politics a crude demonization decontextualization and dehistoricization of what Islam is, what it has meant historically and politically, not only to Muslims, but also to the West, and who Muslims are in their political heterogeneity. The war on terror, instead of responding to the issue of US foreign policy in the Middle East and Central Asia, resorted to propagating Islamophobia in order to obscure the reasons for the resistance to the US-led Western domination of the post-colonial global order. Most of us, I think, would be agreed on this. And many of us would also agree with the many scholars and activists who have tracked the rise of Islamophobia around the world since the launch of the War on Terror, and who note that it is pervasive today in most societies especially so in North America and Europe. But what I'm arguing is that little attempt has been made to deal with this phenomenon of Islamophobia in a substantive manner. In a recent report published by the Center for American Program called Fear Inc., the Roots of the Islamophobia Network in America, the authors identify five key persons at a number of key organizations, four key organizations in the United States that they say are responsible for producing the reports, books, blogs, websites, and media talking points that create suspicion of Muslims and promote hatred against Islam. The authors argue that these handful of activists and ideologues are promoting ideas such as there is a creeping of the Sharia threat, that mosques are radicalizing Muslims to become terrorists, and some of them have even coined the term Victory Mosque to lead the campaign against the building of the mosque and community center near Ground Zero in New York. The report also tracked $43 million that have been paid to the organizations these individuals, five individuals work for, by seven foundations. Now, many of you are probably aware of this report. Those of you who listen to Democracy Now! would have heard the author of the report being interviewed by Amy Goodman. But what are the full implications of this study on Islamophobia? 
And how extensive is this Islamophobic network? The report does not discuss the Muslim Islamophobes who are regularly featured in the mainstream media and who are also regularly loaded by social justice activists. These Islamophobes, I would argue, include Irshad Manji, Ayan Hirsi Ali, many, many of us have written about this feminist network that has emerged. I would also put people like Tariq Fatah, who are speaking as Muslims, and as such are given greater credibility in their public reception, even by movement activists. Then we have the soft Islamophobes, I would argue, like Farid Zakaria, Nilufa Pazera, who all operate under the radar of this high-level Islamophobia, who present themselves as all supporting the good Muslim and the good Islam. The good Muslim and the good Islam is supported even by President Obama, among many others, who argue Islam is a religion of peace. The good Muslim, then, is the Muslim who furthers American imperialism, who leads the charge against Muslims who oppose Western imperialism, who then get defined as bad Muslims. And many of these good Muslims, of course, present themselves as feminists and committed social justice activists. Although many activists and their movements, as I discussed in the pre-9-11 moment had defined globalization as a process of recolonization of the third world, this was not the frame within which they sought to grapple with the rise of Islamist movements in many parts of the Muslim world. And although these movements criticized to differing extent US foreign policy, they did not contest the Islamophobia propagated by the neoconservatives in the Bush administration, by the neoliberals in Canada, and by the social democrats in the Labour government in the UK, but largely adopted the Islamophobia as propagated by the state, and by, as we now learn, this handful of right-wing ideologues. Of course, the social justice movement spoke out against the targeting of Muslims against racial profiling, but as far as Islam was concerned, and most importantly, as far as the Islamist movements were concerned, they developed almost wholesale the demonization of these movements that had become pervasive. This is most obvious in the case of Palestine, for example, where most social justice activists have now given the issue of Palestinian self-determination and the end of the Israeli occupation, the attention and the support it deserves. And they will say, yes, of course they support Palestinians. But Hamas is a terrorist organization. Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. There's very little engagement that we see with the actual politics of Hamas, Hezbollah, their role within the larger Palestinian struggle to end the occupation. Indeed, I would argue that most social justice activists also, in their wholesale adoption of the Islamophobia, has helped this Islamophobia to become more pervasive, more widespread, and even integrated into social justice movements in this new juncture that I've just described. Let me give you an example, another example of what I mean. The question of sovereignty featured large in the Islamist challenges to the US-led Western domination of the Middle East and Central Asia. For despite the popular presentation of the war on terror as provoked by hate-filled Islamic fundamentalism with its supposedly irrational hatred of the West, the question of sovereignty was clearly central to the charges made even by Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda against the US, as it was in Saddam Hussein's support for the Palestinians in their struggle against Israeli occupation of their lands, and in Iraq's and Iran's nuclear ambitions. In the founding of the Al-Qaeda network, for example, bin Laden had announced the commitment of this network to three major causes, ousting US bases from Saudi Arabia, ending the Israeli occupation of Palestine, and lifting the UN sanctions on Iraq. 
In the case of Iraq, Saddam Hussein's attempts to acquire nuclear weapons was not unconnected to acquisition of the same by the Israeli state with the sanction of the quote-unquote international community, chief among which are the US, the UK, and other major Western powers also in possession of these weapons. Sovereignty and the right to self-determination were thus at the heart of the challenge made by Al-Qaeda and the Saddam Hussein regime in their respective confrontations with the US, Israel, and other Western powers. Sovereignty and self-determination, I would argue, are also at the heart of the politics of Hamas and Hezbollah. Yet, this is not a, a, a discussion or a debate that we see taking place in social justice movements at all. Inspired by the writings of Bernard Lewis and Samuel Huntington, the neoconservatives in the Bush administration and their liberal and social democratic allies worked to contain public discussion within the culturalist logic of an epic clash of civilizations. On the left, anti-war and feminist movements no less myopically presented their otherwise sophisticated critiques of US foreign policy, imperialism, and patriarchy within an equally simplistic formulation of the clash of fundamentalisms. This continues to be very popular in the left. For feminists, it was the idea of clash of patriarchies or clash of masculinities that has become very central to their analysis of the global order. I would argue these are completely nonsensical ideas that are devoid of any analysis of power. To equate the power, reach, and range of the US administration, its allied states, NATO, with that of Islamist organizations, is clearly the crassest kind of analysis one could come up with. It's absurd. And yet, this is the analysis we have in most social justice movements. With the war on terror and its foundation in a staunch Islamophobia, Muslims have become constituted not only as a global threat, but as the most preeminent global threat. Most nation states have waged their own war on terror, albeit in varying degrees, on Muslim populations in their midst who are struggling against imperialist domination, against domination by the dictators which were placed often and if not directly placed, supported by the West. Many of us have pointed out that if we look at who's actually targeted by this Islamophobia, it is Muslim certainly, but all those who look like Muslims. Who looks like Muslims? Sikhs, Hindus, even Brazilians. In other words, it's brown and black bodies who look like Muslims that have been targeted in the war on terror. Many of us, myself included, have argued that Islamophobia thus reflects an intersection of religion and race, so that Muslim is understood and treated as a racial category and not just a religious category. But what I'm arguing, and I'm faulting myself in this as well, that we have paid attention to the race part of this equation, but we have ignored the religion part of this equation. We have defined Islamophobia as a form of racial ha hatred, but have largely neglected to pay attention to the religion part of its intersection. And it is this, I argue, that we ignore at a huge political price. We've also argued that Islamophobia is not only gendered, but not only racialized, but also a gendered phenomena. One key is aspect of Islamophobia is propagation of the notion that Islam sanctions patriarchy, misogyny, violence against women, and imprisons women in burqa. Feminists have accepted this view largely with few exceptions. And the consequence is that we define only the violence done by Muslim men against Muslim women as the only violence that shapes the lives of Muslim women's lives. We do not look at the violence of poverty, racism, war, occupation. <laughs> 
and we are also unable to engage in a politics of solidarity with Muslim women who use Islam, who use the rights that they believe they have under Islam to fight against not only the power of individual men, their families, but also the power of the state. And I feel that we are failing to develop a politics that makes it possible for us to build alliance and build solidarity with Muslim feminists who speak their feminism in the language of Islam, in the idiom of Islam, and who are fighting to develop a definition of Islam that speaks to their concerns, their interests. And I think that this will have consequences in the long term for us not to have done the hard work of thinking through what these politics mean. Everybody knows about the Hudud ordinances in Pakistan, for example, that were enacted, implemented by the Zia government, Zia al haq government. But how many of us have read Shanaz Khan's studies where the women who have been imprisoned under the Hudud ordinances, under these Zina laws, working class women, impoverished women, are fighting not only their families who have brought these charges against them, husbands who brought these charges against them, but are also fighting against the state in the name of the rights that Islam gives them as women. Where does our feminist analysis even begin to engage with this kind of experience that women have on the ground? So I worry about the direction in which social justice movements have articulated their anti-imperialist politics, developed anti-imperialist agendas at the cost of working this distinction between the good Muslim, the bad Muslim, which is a key strategy of Islamophobia itself, of having internalized this, and we fail to think what it enables, what it does not allow in developing a politics that is truly anti-imperialist and that can speak to the political ideologies and languages and idioms in which they are being articulated around the world. Thank you.